Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Uh, before we get started, uh, we just want to do some quick introductions. And uh, we have a very quick announcement as well. I am Braden Vincent. I'm the Vice President of the University of Arizona Objectivist Club. Um, some of you may be wondering what is an objectivist and what does an objectivist club do? Well, thanks for asking. Um, objectivism is actually the philosophy of Ayn Rand, uh, the author of uh, Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead and many other books uh, that I don't have time to mention right now. But at its essence, uh, objectivism is the belief that a man's sole uh, moral purpose in life is to seek uh, his own rational self-interest and his own happiness. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm going to pull out my notes for a second. Okay, another, another central ten tenet of uh, objectivism is uh, laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, that, it, that is the only way uh, to preserve individual liberties. Um, and uh, that are necessary to live life according to your own values. Uh, our club is committed to discussing uh, relevant political issues as they apply to objectivist thought. And that's obviously what we're doing here tonight, but this would not have been possible uh, without the help of many, many people. So tonight we would like to thank our co-hosts, uh, the University of Arizona College Republicans and the Young Americans for Freedom who have tables uh, out front. Uh, they helped us prepare this, get the ball rolling. Uh, we would also like to thank the Ayn Rand Institute for uh, their funding and for the resources that we have here tonight. And of course, we would also like to thank our, uh, our debaters, uh, Dr. Joyner, Dr. Brooks, and our moderator, Dr. Stegman. And uh, without further ado, I will turn over the mic to our moderator, Dr. Stegman. Thank you. It is my honor to serve as the neutral party here. Uh, I will keep the introductions very short. I'm a professor in the Eller College. Dr. Joyner, who will speak first by a coin flip that we had a few minutes ago, uh, is a professor in the Eller College, in the School of Public Health, and in the <coughs> College of Medicine, of course, the most important one, and is the former dean of the College of Medicine. And Dr. Brook is the president and executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute. So the format will be, um, Dr. Joyner will have an opening statement, then Dr. Brook. Then I will ask three questions, which each person will have a chance to answer. They will alternate who answers first. They have not seen the questions. I have not um, discussed the questions with them. My goal here as the neutral party is to help everyone <laughs> through these gentlemen become more informed about this highly complex piece of legislation about which there is great uncertainty about the ultimate outcomes. So after the moderator questions, they will each have a, question, a chance to ask the other person a question. Then we will have closing statements, and if brief closing statements, and if we're on schedule, there should be at least half an hour left for your questions. Are we going to, who's uh, looking for my leader? Are the questions going to be collected by cards, or are we going to do that by hands? Hands. Okay, very good. All right, so then without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Joyner. Thank you, Mark. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this debate, and uh, I received a very interesting piece of advice yesterday from a colleague at Tucson Medical Center. Uh, I am on. Is that better? Worse? Let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, she was a drama major in college, and she advised me to stay largely away from logic and to focus on emotion. Now, unfortunately, as my lovely wife looks up, and she's sitting over there, uh, I don't really have an emotional bone, bone in my body. <laughs> so I will start with logic and imagine that as the debate unfolds, uh, my emotions will heat up. <laughs> so uh, I think there's a general consensus probably among 
almost everybody in this room, and certainly more broadly, that health care reform is needed in the U.S. But opinions vary widely on uh, what should be done. And I think on the, in the absence of clearly elucidating the problem we are trying to fix, it's nearly impossible to have a reasonable debate about the potential solutions. Here's the core problem. The U.S. has extremely poor value for the health care dollar when compared with other developed countries. And comparisons are the only meaningful way to judge the performance of our system. There is no absolute standard that we or any other country can use to judge performance. For example, should the U.S. have an infant mortality rate per 1,000 live births of 5, of 10, of 7.42? On average, in the U.S., we spend, either per capita or as a percentage of GDP, 2.3 times more than other developed countries on health care. If we got what we were paying for, we should have by far the best health outcomes. But we don't, not even close. Using a range of metrics from infant mortality to life expectancy, to outcomes in diabetes, heart disease, and many more, they typically rank towards the bottom. I'm sure some of you are saying to yourselves, wait, we have the best healthcare system in the world. The simple fact is that we don't. We unquestionably can provide the most technologically sophisticated care of any nation, but that is neither a direct measure of overall quality nor of value within our system. Up until the Affordable Care Act, the U.S. was the only developed country without a mechanism for universal access to care. The 50 million uninsured in the U.S. who, demo who have demonstrably poor health than those, without insu th those with insurance are a major reason our health care quality lags behind other countries. They also contribute to higher costs. Up to one-seventh of health insurance premiums go to cover the costs for unreimbursed care. When individuals are forced to use the emergency room for their primary care, no one benefits. A common retort is that healthcare in all other countries is socialized medicine. It supposedly leads to lack of consumer choice, long waits, an overbearing bureaucracy, and more. Put simply, these characterizations are inaccurate, misleading, and oversimplified, as pointed out by study after study. And they ignore the fact that some of the most highly regarded programs in the U.S. by consumers for value, for efficiency, for friendliness are Medicare and the Veterans Administration health care system. In fact, the latter is a classical socialized medicine delivery system. Our health care costs and overall quality are a tremendous drag on our economy. On a global level, they impact our competitiveness. On an individual level, Two-thirds of all personal bankruptcies and the majority of home foreclosures are due to medical expenses. We are the only developed country in which either can happen. So what do we do? You will hear tonight an argument that capitalism and the market are the best approach, or at least I assume that's what you're going to hear. But it's not, uh, it's, it's not going to come from me. <laughs> uh, and that government regulation and intervention not only led to the current situation, but are to be opposed at every step. Uh, as you can imagine from what I've said, I could not disagree more. The market has not, will not, and cannot improve the situation in the absence of government involvement. Why is this? It's because healthcare violates, more so than any other industry, basic features required for a market to function. In a well-functioning market, the buyers, in this case, healthcare consumers, have full information about the value and the cost of what they are buying, and hence are able to compare products and services based on price and quality. This process drives meaningful competition, meaningful competition and increases in efficiency. In healthcare, consumers can typically judge neither the quality of the care they are receiving, nor do they know the total cost of those services. Prices are obfuscated particularly for inpatient care. It is only when patients receive the bill that they learn of their out-of-pocket costs, which it, should, which it should be pointed out are not the total cost of the system. Competition based on either price or quality is largely precluded. This is not a functioning market. 
and it is why government regulation is needed. Regulation leads to quality standards for providers, hospitals, and insurers. It helps to control costs. Government service government serves as a steward for the health care needs of the entire population. Where does the Affordable Care Act come in? It provides a mechanism for the vast majority of uninsured Americans to obtain coverage and avoid the disastrous consequences of being uninsured. It allows children up to age 26 to stay on their parents' health insurance policies. It guarantees that individuals with pre-existing pre conditions, such as cancer or heart disease or being a woman, can purchase affordable insurance. Healthy individuals who develop an illness cannot be charged more or have their coverage dropped. Medicaid expansion and the health insurance marketplaces guarantee that individuals previously unable to afford coverage can now do so. The list goes on and on. And when the public is surveyed, they are in favor of all of these individual changes by a two to one margin or more. This is all done with transparency and pricing, true competition among private insurers, and succinct, clear descriptions of benefits and costs. In the absence of regulations, these have not and would not happen. Insurance companies would cherry pick the healthiest consumers and price discriminate without sufficient attention to, the, uh, to ability to pay or to need. They seek to maximize profits, which is exactly what their shareholders expect them to do. We don't have to guess about this. this there's overwhelming evidence that it happens. Now, I'm be, may, gonna presuppose again that Dr. Brooke may contend that overregulation of the insurance industry has created the problem. My response, even the most conservative analysts of analysts who've looked carefully at the data can do otherwise. More importantly, it doesn't pass the SNP test. The US already spends more than other countries and has worse outcomes. The reasons are multiple, but further unleashing the profit motive in the absence of a functioning market will only exacerbate the problem. I have 30 seconds left, and so I wanted to use it to butter up my opponent. Um, <laughs> I want to say that when I went on the Ayn Rand site and looked at uh, the, 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 the videos, the thing I was most struck with is they stick to principles. They don't get caught up in minor details, and, and it's, it's very refreshing to be able to have a discussion about the philosophy and about the principles, rather than some of the um, less helpful and um, less informative uh, uh, issues that come up in the press <coughs> with the politicians. That wouldn't be for me. I was going to compromise right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> This is good because the disagreement is pretty fundamental. Not only about Obamacare, but about the causes of the current crisis, if there is one, and about what the nature of the crisis actually is. In other words, the efficacy of the American healthcare system as it is today. There are dramatic differences, even when it comes to simple factual issues like that. So let me, let me start by asking, you know, what is the problem? And we kind of agree, the problem is the costs are too, seem to be too high. We've got a lot of people uninsured. We've got people with pre-existing condition who can't get new insurance. We've got this problem of emergency rooms, people going to emergency rooms. That's not the ideal place to do, to treat people for, for the flu. Uh, what wasn't mentioned is a, a crisis in the making, in my view, uh, in Medicare. Medicare is you know, bankrupt, to put it mildly. Uh, if you project costs into the future, it is draining the funding of this country in dramatic fashion. It's probably underfunded by something like $60 trillion. That's not my number, that's, that's the government's number, uh, in terms of uh, future expectations versus future revenues. And Medicaid, which produces very low quality health care and very low quality results and is incredibly expensive and is bankrupting in the process of bankrupting many states. This is, this is a, a cost that is being pushed down to the state level. So we've got two massive government programs. Medicare, no question, provides some of the best health care in the world, um, but at the same time, it's costing a fortune. My view is all of these, without a doubt, all of these are caused by too much government. Too much government regulation, too much government involvement, too much government purchasing of health care. So let's start with this fact, and hopefully this is one fact we can agree on. We don't have free market healthcare in the United States today. 
The, free mar the market in healthcare today is heavily regulated. It has elements that are free, but it has heavy, heavy involvement of government. Of every dollar spent on healthcare in the United States, government spends 51 cents. So this is not a market. This is a mixed. A lot of government, some private health care. And even the private health care part of it, the, the insurance segment of it, is heavily, heavily regulated and controlled. Every one of these things, costs, uninsured, all of these are problems created by this structure. Why are health care costs high? Well, the answer is pretty simple, right? When the government starts buying hammers, the price of hammers goes up. When people spend other people's money, they don't pay attention to costs. No matter what government buys, prices go up. Look at your tuition. <laughs> it's not an accident that tuition is going through the roof as government is intensifying its efforts to subsidize your tuition, to give you more and more student loans. This has been growing. The more loans and the cheaper the loans are, guess what will happen? Tuition will go up. Costs always go up when the government starts buying stuff. Go back to kind of military spending and you can see this in spades. Why do we have uninsured? Because insurance policy is expensive. Why are they expensive? They're expensive because they're ridiculously regulated by the states, not the federal government, in this case the states. In California, I'm, I'm 52, I've got two kids about your age, and I'm done. We're not having any more kids. But when I buy health insurance t today in California, I have to buy pregnancy coverage, right? I have to buy a whole bunch of coverages that I'm never going to use. Everybody knows I'm never going to use. Now, what happens to prices when they cover more than you're going to use? They're going to be much higher because the insurance company doesn't know that we don't plan to have any more kids, and it couldn't price that anyway. Say prices as if I am. So the uninsured problem is caused by the fact that we have very expensive insurance coverage. We don't have competition in insurance. Yeah, the insurance companies, there are very few insurance companies because very few of them can work with the government. So we have very few of them. We don't have real competition. We don't have real innovation. We've never experienced real insurance markets. On top of that, and this relates to pre-existing condition, but also to uninsured, we have become accustomed in this country to getting our health insurance from our employer. Why? We don't get our home insurance from our employer. We don't get our auto insurance from our employer. We don't get our life insurance from our employer. We get them as individuals. If you lose your job, you lose your health care coverage. That's weird. <laughs> what does your job got to do with your health care insurance? Nothing. Why do we get our health insurance from our, from, uh, from our employer, not private? Because government has given them a tax advantage, and as an individual, you don't get that tax advantage. This goes back to World War II. Ask me if you're interested in all this. And we can go on and on about how government basically completely regulates and distorts this market. What have we done with Obamacare? What we've done with Obamacare is doubled up. We've said, and this, this by the way, is just a general principle in, in politics. Whenever something doesn't work, try more of it. Right? <laughs> Stimulus doesn't work, so we'll do a bigger one. We'll do it, you know, uh, uh, minimum wage causes unemployment, so rent raises even higher. And we can go on and on. It's exactly what we're doing here, right? We're going to regulate insurance companies even more. We're going to have them require coverage that I don't want, require even more coverage that I don't actually want. We're going to intensify all of this to make it more difficult to destroy more of the market, and ultimately the consequence is going to be exactly the same, raising costs. Now, I could, you know, I could say a lot about socialized medicine, which I have personal experience with. I'll just say this. I completely disagree. Outcomes in the United States are far, far, far better off, and I'll just give you two quick examples. My father is a physician in Israel. Israel has one of the best healthcare systems in the world. It's a Jewish country, so it has lots of doctors. Um, and, but when my dad had a patient who was really, really sick and who could afford it, he put him on a plane and he flew him to the Mayo Clinic. When Berlusconi, the prime minister, the rich prime minister of Italy, gets sick, he doesn't go to France, which according to the UN has the best healthcare system in the world. He comes to the US. There is no question that if you're insured, 
if you're insured, in that area where we allow some private medicine, we have the best healthcare system in the world. If you take out the factors of lifestyle and other factors, and you look at heart disease and cancer, if you have heart disease and cancer, this is the country you want to be in, nowhere else. And again, we can talk about infant mortality and why that happens in life expectancy and so on. But you do not want to be treated in any other healthcare system other than the United States uh, if, you have, if you have health issues. Now, there's a fundamental here which we'll get to, I think it'll come up. What Obamacare does and what healthcare generally has become is a massive mechanism to redistribute wealth. Right now, the focus really is on sacrificing you, young and healthy, well not you because you get covered by your parents, but once you hit 27, you will be sacrificed for the sick and old. Generally, we, have, we, we don't have insurance anymore. We have a massive system of redistribution of wealth from young and healthy to sick and old. Now, I believe that is immoral. I believe that's wrong. I think you guys should be out in the streets demonstrating against it because it's going to screw your lives. And I'm out of time. that we uh, hold applause until the end um, so that we don't get into an applause competition. And that will also... Um... <laughs> well, it's, it's good. But, but, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have a, we're a market in applause here, so uh, lacking a market will suppress it until the end. But after the closing speeches might be a good time. So according to our, our preset plan, uh, the first question will go first to... Uh, Dr. Brook, and my question is, the legislative process that created the Affordable Health Care Act was messy, with many powerful interest groups trying to affect the final legislation. Looking at the law that finally emerged from that process, who are the winners and the losers? Wow. Um, I think almost everybody's a loser. Uh, I think there are very few winners. Insurance companies are winners in the short term. They get massive subsidies. They get supposedly, if everybody signs up, they get new entrants. So in the short term, they're winners. But in the long term, there will be no insurance companies in the U.S. This is just, I mean, Obamacare is just a stepping stone towards universal health care and towards complete socialization of, of medicine. It, never, it was never meant to work. The idea that Obamacare was meant to work, in my view, is ridiculous. It was, it's set up to fail, and the failure will then lead to universal health care. Uh, patients, uh, you know, you guys who are young are particularly uh, screwed. Um, I think if, you're, if you have pre-existing conditions and you're in your 50s, um, you know, you're better off. You're worse off because you have less freedom, but you're better off because your health care is taken care of, I guess, because you guys are going to be are going to be paying for it. Um, so I think I think it's primarily those who are with pre-existing conditions, who are older who are, in the short term, you know, better off. But long term, nobody is. Because long term, what the system leads to, what all socialized medicine leads to, it is rationing, it leads to government controls over procedures, it leads to a complete disappearance of innovation, of, of real competition, of trying new things. You know, it's not an accident that over 75% of all medical innovation happens in the United States. And we're trying to kill that. And the whole world will suffer because they, they free right off of us all the time. They free right off of our drugs. They free right off of our medical devices. They free right off of our, of our new procedures. We develop them. We pay the cost for them. And they get them basically for free. So long term, everybody loses. Short term, they are here and there winners. But let me just say, this sausage process of, of creating legislation, this is the problem. This is why healthcare shouldn't be, the government should have, should have no involvement in healthcare. Because the whole issue gets decided by pressure groups, by who gets what. I mean, the discussions now about, you know, this business lobby and that business lobby, lobbying for this, lobbying for that, extend this, give us this favor. It's not designed to be the best, because it can't be, because it's designed by, because it's about redistribution, it's designed by all kinds of pressure groups who want to make sure that they get stuff and don't have to pay for stuff. So it becomes a battle of, of, these, of these forces that are fighting each other. And this is the nature of, of economic legislation out there. 
What it results in is a disaster. It usually leads to more problems, not to solutions. And, you know, again, in the marketplace, you, you don't get this. In the marketplace, you get real competition. What you get is, is a process by which uh, innovation is encouraged, <coughs> innovation is successful, and where people have an opportunity to insure themselves, maybe to self-insure themselves, to make decisions about how to use their money for the furtherance of their lives to the best of their ability. I'm out of time. Well, um, so first of all, let me start off by saying that this, de this debate is, is supposed to be about the Affordable Care Act. And a lot of what uh, uh, Yaron was talking about is, was not part of the Affordable Care Act. And specifically, that's cost control. So I think one of the ways that benefit will ultimately uh, come about through the Affordable Care Act is through cost control, not only through some of the mechanisms that I didn't mention, but that, that are in the Act. Now, why wasn't there more cost control in the Act? Because everybody loses when there's cost control. The doctors lose, the insurers lose, the medical device manufacturers lose, the pharmaceutical companies lose, and the consumers lose if what it means is that you have to bear more of the cost. Here's the other reason why there wasn't more cost control. It has been very difficult, if not impossible, to control Medicare costs because seniors push back against any notion that they're going to have a cut in benefits. So the legislature over and over and over overrides the, the, uh, the recommendations of a group called MedPAC, which says that the cost should be controlled. I think that everybody is going to benefit in terms of the transparency and pricing. It will become more possible to have a true market. I, I don't agree, as you could tell, with the notion that we really have a market here. And I think I made that as clear as I could. Uh, and then um, I think the biggest winners are those who are under, uninsured or underinsured. That's a lot of people. And it is devastating to these people. The health insurance, the, the Affordable Care Act is fundamentally an insurance act. That's what it is. The Obama administration wanted to put more cost controls in. They were stymied at every point by the legislature, which I'm not saying is right or wrong. It's just that's not what the Affordable Care Act is about. I agree we spend too much. But there are other approaches that have to be brought to bear to control the cost. I think the Affordable Care Act is a first step. We didn't talk about when, what some of the mechanisms are, but, um, but we might get into that. Now, just, I just have to respond to this comment about international comparisons. I just, th that's not what the data says. It just is not what the data says. Patients with heart disease, diabetes, respiratory disease do worse here than age-matched, gender-matched, income-matched individuals in other countries. They just do. That's what the data says. And anybody who wants to look at uh, a report, I encourage you to look at the Institute of Medicine report that came out within the last year. The Institute of Medicine is the most prestigious body of physicians in the United States. My wife happens to be a member of it. There's only about 500 members. And they, they are basically uh, acknowledging just what I said. Second question will be answered first by Dr. Joyner, by prior agreement. So all of the other industrialized countries have systems where everybody effectively has health insurance. That doesn't mean we should do that, but that's an observation of how those countries run their systems. In this country, there are certain markets, notably the car insurance market, where the government requires drivers to have car insurance. Again, that doesn't imply that we should do that in health insurance. There is, I think, a fundamental philosophical question underneath your different responses so far in your opening remarks. So I'd like you to address this fundamental question rather than the details of the Affordable Care Act. And the question is, in a well-designed health care system, should people have the option of whether or not to have health insurance? We first Dr. Joyner and then Dr. Brown. 
Well, um, I would say yes, they should have that option if they also take accountability for the costs associated with any illness that they acquire. That's the fundamental problem with not having insurance uh, and, and needing care. Basically what's happening is that the costs that are being borne by the system get passed on to other people. And you know, that health, health care is something that we know everybody will need. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the... Is there a... There's something going on here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> unlike even car insurance, not everybody drives, but everybody is going to need health care. And again, I don't think one should be forced to buy health insurance, but by the same token, um, to imagine that you don't need to buy health insurance and then the cost for that and the societal complications and 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 economic consequences are going to be passed on to others, I think, is a real problem. Uh, that's why, uh, among other reasons, why every other developed country has a way to provide coverage for the entire population. And there's multiple different ways to do it. One looks across the spectrum in other countries, and it's not socialized medicine, even close to it, using the conventional definition. In fact, there's far less government involvement in many of the countries in Europe than, than there is in the United States, far less. Only 10% or so of the spending in Germany, uh, France, comes directly from the government. It comes from employees and employers. So I think that uh, when, I, when I've traveled uh, to Europe, uh, and you know, I'm not suggesting this is necessarily the attitude that we have in the United States, in fact, it's not the attitude. They just cannot understand how we could have a society where we don't provide health care coverage. It's just beyond imagination. And I think it's because they, they view this as something that, if not a, a basic human right, is something that people um, will always need to access and that they can't predict when it's going to be. There's uncertainty associated with health and health care. And the way to deal with that is insurance. So, I mean, this really goes to the heart of the philosophical difference, I think. Um, I don't think society has obligations towards people. Society is not responsible for you. You are responsible for yourself. Society shouldn't dictate whether you have health insurance or not. Now, as a consequence, you should bear the cost if you get sick and you don't have those insurance. You should bear the cost. And there's only two ways in which if you can't bear those costs, you can, you know, you can get, if you will, health services. Let's say your neighbor is sick and he can't afford to get the treatment. He doesn't have the money and you live in my kind of world, right? Where if you don't have health insurance, you're not going to get treated. He has two options. He can come to me or to anybody and ask for help. And I might help him. I think people generally are generous. There's lots of charity in the world. And I might not. It might be time to pay that tuition bill for my kids, right? And I don't have the money to help. That's option one. His second option is to pull out a gun and take my money. Those are the only two options. There are no other options. What we are, what we are saying, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. What we are saying is that if he gets the community together and they vote to take my money, then it's okay. Because when we say everybody has to have insurance, well, who's going to pay for that insurance? Well, we are. How are we going to pay? Well, we're going to be, it's going to be forced from us by the point of a gun. Try not paying your taxes. So you can either ask for help through charity or you can steal the money. Democracy allows you to vote to steal some people's money and give it to others. That to me is morally wrong, morally offensive. My money is my money. You want my help, ask for it. I'm not obliged to help you morally, I'm not obliged to help you legally, but you certainly have no right to steal my money. It doesn't matter how sick you are, it doesn't give you a right to my stuff. 
<clears throat> it doesn't give you a right to my stuff. That's the fundamental moral question. Does any group, because they have a need, does that need give them a right to take from others? Does the fact that they're today 55-year-olds who are, who are uninsured give them a right to your stuff? Because you're going to have to pay higher premiums under Obamacare so that they can pay lower premiums, so that we can redistribute wealth from you to them. Why? Why shouldn't you have the right, the ability, to make decisions about how to use your money? What kind of choices to make with how to spend the hard-earned dollars that you will make when you go out there and work? I mean, you guys love choice, right? You love choice when it comes to who to marry. You love choice what to smoke, right? <laughs> Why don't you want choice about how to use your own money? I'm up. I did have some prepared questions, but given how the <laughs> debate has gone, I am going to go a little bit off agenda. And for the third question, I'm actually going to ask two, I hope, shorter questions. So the first question, so they have a two-part question. The first question is very specific. Right now, federal legislation, federal law requires that an emergency room admit someone for care regardless of their insurance status. Should that law be eliminated? Oops. Now I've got your problem. problem. <laughs> Should that law be eliminated? Should people continue to have the right to show up in an emergency room, or should the emergency room be able to say no? The second question is, it will clearly take time to fully assess the effects of the Affordable Care Act. In the end, what measures should we use to determine, objectively, whether it is a success or failure? compared to the status quo that existed before the act. So, uh, emergency rooms. What's interesting about this is by law, emergency rooms are required to treat anybody who walks in. But this is a relatively new law. It was passed in 1986 under the Reagan administration. Uh, I believe in repealing that law. Yes, I believe emergency rooms should have the option to turn people away. Certainly if you have the snivels, you should be allowed to be turned away. Um, or if you can't pay for something that's not urgent. But the fact is, pre-1986, it was unheard of that an emergency room would, would uh, turn somebody away for a life-threatening disease. Every hospital had a charity fund that funded those cases where they had to treat them, where it was life or death. But if it's not life or death, yeah, if you can't pay for it, you shouldn't get it. If I can't pay for food, You're up for charity to go get food. You don't have a right to take money. How do you measure success or failure? I mean, to me, the measures of success or failure at the end of the day, <clears throat> measures of, of freedom, of individual liberty. I mean, how free are we uh, at the end of the day? Are we freer in terms of the choices we have, in terms of uh, the options that are available to us? And I'm not just talking about freedom of the consumer, but freedom of the producer as well. A doctor's freer, a nurse's freer, a medical device manufacturers, drug companies freer once Obamacare is implemented or before Obamacare. I mean, we all know the answer to this. Uh, they're a lot less free under Obamacare, and therefore, I've already declared it a failure um, by that standard. To me, the standard is individual liberty. It's not a consequentialist. It's not how many people are, are healthier or the costs or any of these other issues, although I believe strongly, and I think there's plenty of strong evidence that freedom leads to the good consequences. Prices go down when you have competition and when you have freedom and when you have liberty. You know, LASIK, which is not covered by any insurance policy, technology has improved dramatically over the last 20 years. And guess what's happened to costs? Gone down. Just because government is not involved in LASIK other than approving the technology, they leave it alone. They don't regulate it, they don't control insurance companies, and so on. And you look at very similar phenomena in, uh, uh, what do you call it, pet medicine. Uh, veterinary. <coughs> veterinary medicine, very similar phenomena. Prices go down, competition does it. So, I believe strongly that when you allow for liberty of the individual, you get the right outcomes as well. Um, because Obamacare violates the principles of liberty, the principles of choice, the principles of freedom, it is already a failure, and nothing that it can achieve will change that. 
So, um, let's just say that, uh, unfortunately, one of you on your way home tonight uh, is in a car, you're hit by a drunk driver in your car, and let's just say you don't have health insurance, and you show up in the emergency room. By Euron's argument, now he says if it's not life or death, um, then the emergency room shouldn't see it. Well, as a physician, I would like to say, determine, making that determination in some sort of clean way is impossible. It's impossible. There's a, there's a gray zone, and you know, I, I won't sort of give examples, but I could easily give examples. So I think to imagine that uh, people shouldn't be able to get care in an emergency room if they don't have insurance because you can somehow discriminate people who need it from somehow those who don't is a fallacy. Of course, of course there, are, I mean, I, I, I completely agree that it doesn't make sense for, to use the emergency room for primary care. That's why the Affordable Care Act is such a good idea. It's exactly what happened in Massachusetts when they adopted Romney Care, which, as you understand, I suspect, is, was the template for the Affordable Care Act. Emergency department use has gone down. Quality has gone up. Costs are going through the roof, and, and I, you know, I, again, that's not the debate as far as I'm concerned here because that's not what, a, what the Affordable Care Act is about. Now, uh, I have to comment on the LASIK example. I thought maybe this was coming. That's not what health insurance is supposed to be about, not for something like LASIK, which is a completely elective procedure where it's, you know, there's, there's not uncertainty about whether, uh, you know, you're going to get the procedure or not, whether you're going to get sick or not. That's exactly the sort of circumstance that insurance shouldn't cover. It shouldn't cover cosmetic surgery. It shouldn't, and it doesn't for the very reasons that that's not what insurance is for. Insurance is for uncertain events. Uncertain events like getting hit by a car. Uncertain events like, uh, you know, and I'll bring this up now, uh, uh, you know, it's just unimaginable to me that people should be held accountable for their health-related uh, problems that are genetic in origin. If a woman has, uh, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations, like Angelina Jolie has, she has a 90% chance of getting breast cancer. Well, uh, is, it, is it reasonable to think that she shouldn't be able to, um, she should have to pay for it because she had a genetic predisposition that came from her parents? By the logic I'm hearing here, she should have chosen different parents. <laughs> Keep the audience reaction uh, for later, and you will have a chance to direct questions to the speakers. We're now in the phase where each can ask one question to the other, and then we'll move to closing statements. So by uh, the original plan, um, Dr. Brooke has a chance to ask Dr. Joyner a question with a two-minute response, and then likewise. So I'm just... Uh, I'm curious about uh, your view on the redistributive impact of all of these, uh, of Obamacare, and, and really all social aid medicine, and how morally, if we can shift to it, uh, you view that as justifiable. That's the question. I think it's completely moral. I think it's completely justified for society to look out after the health of their citizens. I think that's, that's what a society should do, and government is the way that that's accomplished in conjunction, hopefully, with private, the, the private sector. One of the problems with the Affordable Care Act, uh, in terms of implementation, is that it is an attempt to integrate government and private industry, and that just doesn't work very well. I mean, we both agree upon that. So, uh, you know, you can make the argument, well, you privatize it all, and I clearly don't think that's a good idea, but you could also make the argument that you have a single-payer system. And, and I'm not going to say that's the right idea or the wrong idea, but if you sit in the middle, you are going to have problems. The Affordable Care Act was um, constructed based on the notion 
that we wanted to keep our employer-sponsored insurance process the same. And I disagree about why that's why we got started down that path, and I understand I'm wandering a little off the topic. But the reason why employer-sponsored insurance was adopted in the United States is that wage and price caps were put on place during World War II for industries. And in order to attract employees, they gave additional benefits. And then we followed something called path dependence, where we've just kept modifying that system. I agree it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But it is the system we've had, and we tried to stay with it through the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, if we had to start all over again, we wouldn't do it that way. But we're not starting all over again in this country any more than any other country is, because we're too far down the path. I've already, I'd like to hear another description of how insurance regulation is responsible for, let's just say, higher costs. Because I can't connect those dots, and neither can the analysts that I've read, including Chris Conover from the Cato Institute, which is one of the most conservative sort of think tanks there is. I mean, the, the, the data that I see and the data that I read about doesn't connect insurance regulation to higher costs. Well, I'd, I'd suggest reading Cannon again, because I don't think that's the conclusion yeah. it comes to. But um, I'd suggest reading John Cochran from the University of Chicago, who's done a lot of work on, on, on health care pricing and, and how a market would look like if it was truly privatized. And I think, I think he would agree. I think the number of ways in which uh, Any time you, so for example, um, I gave the one example of, of mandates. Mandates clearly raise the cost. If, if you added to a auto insurance that they were required to pay for oil changes, if they were required to uh, pay for every scratch, whether you, the consumer, wanted that coverage or not, then auto insurance prices would go up because they would have a much broader spectrum in which to cover. There's another sense in which, uh, and, and this goes back to the, to the tax advantage. Because employers buy insurance, there's less competition. There are far more of these groups, employer groups, and therefore there, there are far fewer products. The, the products that the insurance companies devise are devised for these group policies rather than individual policies, individual needs, which would generate you know, a lot more competition and ultimately lower prices. Um, so, but regulations generally, you go industry after industry after industry, whenever you have regulations, and if you go to places like California and New York where you have heavy regulations, prices are higher. So for example, in, in New York, where you've got, where you've got uh, imposed guarantees, um, costs are through the roof in, in, uh, in, uh, in New York, and indeed Obamacare is actually reducing the costs for New Yorkers. Uh, under, under, in New York, you're actually, under Obamacare, you get cheaper health insurance. Because it was so heavily regulated before, there's actually a reduction in a sense of regulation. So regulation always raises the cost of doing business because it constrains competition. It constrains, it, it, it allows the insurance companies to control the markets. It, this happens in every single industry out there. Now each, now each speaker has a chance to make a three-minute closing statement, and according to the original plan, uh, the first opportunity goes to Dr. Joyner, then Dr. Brooke will make the final statement, and after these closing statements, I think applause would be appropriate if you wish to do so, and then after that, we will go to audience questions. Well, I'm going to return to the basic point I made in my introductory statements, and that is that healthcare doesn't operate like a market. And I'm just gonna reiterate that there's too much uncertainty, there's no understanding at any sort of appropriate level, at any meaningful level of what quality of care means. You know whether you get better or worse. That may or may not be related to the care you get, because in general, consumers, there's, it's, it's information asymmetry. But worse, the costs are, are obscured. And the costs are obscured in part, if not in large part, because of the profit motive. 
The costs are not obscured with Medicare, but the costs are absolutely obscured frequently with private insurance. And one of the things that that has done is to drive prices through the roof. The prices of our services in the United States are three to four times those what they are in other developed countries. Our, our costs are not higher because we utilize more services. In fact, we utilize less. People go to the doctor less, they have fewer hospitalizations, they have shorter hospital stays, we have fewer physicians. So in terms of utilization, we are lower than most other developed countries. But our prices are three to four times as high. Why is that? Because there's no price transparency. If there's price transparency, then you have competition. In the absence of price transparency, you can't possibly have competition because nobody knows what the price is. Nobody knows what the cost is. I just want to come back to this issue of, uh, of, of insurance and the problem that one gets into uh, with insurance if you don't price it appropriately with redistribution. And that is a well-known concept called adverse selection. And this is crystal clear that this happens in healthcare and in the health insurance part. If you have a group of individuals who have insurance uh, and they're paying approximately the same amount of premiums, but some of them are healthier, some of them are sicker, the ones that are healthier are gonna drop out of the insurance pool potentially. That raises the cost for those who are insured um, and are sicker. This leads to what's called a death spiral, and it unravels very quickly. There's all sorts of evidence for this, and you just can't have a situation that functions where insurance companies are setting prices where they can charge people who are sicker more uh, and, and, and have a functioning system. So, So let me try and make uh, two quick points. Of course, healthcare can operate as a market. Yes, there are massive asymmetries of information. That's what markets are for, to solve those problems. And the problem is a lack of imagination. I can think of 10 different ways in which the profit motive could lead to closing the, those asymmetries of information. We don't see it today because we have no market. The adverse selection problem, exists absolutely but it is solved by markets when they are free to function properly you don't get death spirals you actually get healthy markets that produce products that consumers actually desire price visibility price visibility is a consequence of consumers demanding that if you create a system like we have today where consumers have no incentive to demand that of course there's no price transparency markets are the way to get all of these things but I want to step back a moment, <laughs> not get caught up in the economics and make this one point. We have a fundamentally different vision of what society should be like and its function should be. I believe that government is there to do one thing and one thing only. The role of government is to eliminate coercion from human life. It's to allow us to be free. It's to allow us to pursue our happiness, to allow us to pursue our lives, to make choices that we see fit. Make mistaken choices, make good choices, all kinds of choices. But government is there to protect us from the crooks, the frauds, the gangsters, the terrorists, the foreign invaders. But other than that, to leave us alone. To let us pursue our lives. To let us make choices. To let us use our minds. To engage with reality. To find the best path for each one of us. And they're going to be different paths to achieve our happiness by pursuit of rational values. Government is not there to be our nanny. Government is not there to protect us from ourselves. It's not there to protect us from the marketplace. That's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to go out there and live the best lives that we can live. When government tries to do all those things, the only way it can do those things is by limiting our liberty, limiting our options, reduce our ability to pursue our life liberty and happiness and that is the tragedy of america today and the tragedy of where healthcare and the rest of the country are heading thank you